welcome to our fourth yeah, fourth session for the year. And today we've got a two special guests from Context uh, here to share with you uh, some insights to the information security industry and as well as what it's like to transition from a student to a graduate. Um, before we continue, we've got some stuff to go through, which is the just general announcements. So for those who are new today, we've got a full team starting from the president, which is me. That's actually snakes backwards. Karen, who's our president, sitting at the second row, putting his hand up really low. Um, a treasurer at the back, Ket, who's in charge of making sure everything gets paid. Uh, our first female ambassador, Caitlin, sitting in the middle there. And we've got Jeremy, our photographer, who should be taking pictures. Um, on that note, if you are holding a can of Red Bull, you are giving consent to being taken a photo of, because we, we need it for the sponsoring. <laughs> um, and you can find us on Slack. Those are our, our handles. What we do, so we've got like weekly presentations every Wednesday between 6 to 8 p.m. Um, we've got uh, guest speakers like today. Uh, we also have our, our final Wednesday of the month is Tech Talk. Uh, so all, all of our, a lot of our members go to that. It is scheduled into our uh, activities. There are also two other activities that our members go to, which is All Tech, which collides with our schedule. Um, and Bucks One, which happens to be on Friday, and it's held at one of our uh, at, risk, at the risk headquarters, <laughs> you know who those guys are. Uh, our annual events, we compete regularly in CTF. You can check, check, check that out in the CTF channel. And our big annual event is the SciSCA event, which we're training for right now. Um, we also go to conferences within Melbourne Interstate, uh, and we do a lot of job networking. For the, those who want to do extra work, we've got Immersive Labs and Hack the Box, and as well as Pentest for Labs. We are, we're so start, training has started, so thank you for coming to the first training session today. I hope you all practice loading your VM. <laughs> if you need help with that, I'll be back, or I'll stay back after the talk to go through that with some of you. Um, so Immersive Labs, for those who want to do some extra work outside of their coursework, uh, Immersive Lab is good for, for baseline prep. For those who are really good at what they do already, Karen's your man, hit him up for the Deacon, Deacon team. That's done. You know about that. We've, we've updated our schedule in there. So if, if there's any updates with the speakers, it, 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 it lands in our cool looking website. Uh, and the merch is coming. Where's Ivy? She's not here. She has the merch with her. So if you need to ask someone, ask her. <laughs> I didn't have one. So. <laughs> so our first speaker for today is Matt, and he's here to talk about transitioning from a student to a grad position. Thanks, Matt. All right, uh, I suppose this is the one I talk into. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Matt. Um, I recently graduated university. I came out of Melbourne Uni like, a year and a half ago, um, and I went straight into full-time work. It was quite the change, I might, I might say. So what I'm doing today is I'm gonna talk about um, how I found a job, uh, how uh, I, uh, sort of become used to that job and gotten involved and figured out how things work. It's a big change. And then also maybe give some tips about how you can find a job like that. Um, so as I said, I studied computer and software systems um, and that was three years. Uh, that, that was an interesting, interesting course because I started out uh, actually wanting to do civil engineering and I didn't know where I wanted to go. Uh, about a year and I figured that civil engineering wasn't too much, wasn't my, my way of going and physics was just a bit boring. So I spent a lot of time prior to that uh, playing with computers. I had a room full of computers all, all in pieces at home and I think that it is just something that I find quite fun to play with. And prior to that, um, after high school I worked in the outdoor education industry. I would take tourists into caves and show them a fun time. And as I said now, I'm at Con Context Information Security and my job title is an assurance consultant. And that's one of the biggest things I've found about going out of uni is I didn't know what opportunities there were. I didn't know what assurance consultant meant, and I still don't really. Um, but you've got assurance, and you've got advisory, and you've got GRC, and all these things that really I didn't learn any of that in university. And I had to have people to tell me. I had to ask people. And they're, the, they're, the, they're the difficult things to find out. Um, so how did I find a job? Well, as I said, I didn't know I'd end up in InfoSec. 
I, I was studying programming and computer science, and I, I, I sort of thought that everyone would just go out of there and go straight into programming or sysadmin kind of thing. I thought that was sort of the limited roles that you could go into, and, and I didn't really know what I was going to do. I was just doing it because I enjoyed it. Um, in my spare time, I'd like to program things, I'd like to hack things, I'd like to, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of uh, sort of like hack the box and TTF out there that I was doing in my spare time while at uni. But none of that was any, ever anything that I did at, at uni. The next thing that really worked for me was networking. I had a friend uh, that I met doing outdoors activities, we'd go hiking every weekend, and he actually had a role at Contech a couple of years ago. Um, and we sort of spoke about it, we, we knew we shared those same interests, but <coughs> sorry. Uh, but uh, we, I it sort of just sat there and hung around for about two, two or three years and nothing really came of it. But eventually he was moving on and um, I was at a party one night and he was there and he was like, hey, maybe do you want a job? I was like, sure, I, I, I just finished uni at this point. And I, I suppose it was a bit of luck that timing sort of worked out like that. I'd finished uni, I'd gone, uh, spent summer overseas and came back and was just trying to figure out what I was doing because I really had no idea. He offered me a job and from there I went through the usual process. So it wasn't like a fast track or anything, but what networking can provide is these contacts into companies and, and that's where if someone seems in, has seen your name before, it's quite helpful. Uh, but in this case, he um, passed my CV on and uh, then I just went through the regular process, went for an interview, um, after that got an offer and sort of went from there. I, I know everyone comes out of university with different experiences. Um, some look for jobs for years and barely find anything even in hospitality. But for myself, I, I think it was a bit of luck and timing. Um, and I also think that um, what I was doing, having an experience and um, actually in my spare time, playing with these technologies and breaking them, that was also a very key aspect to it, which I'll get onto later. Let me just get a drink. So, my next one is that there's a big difference between university and being in a full-time job, and I never thought there would be, I, I, I had no idea. I, I sort of, came out of university, and university for me was anywhere between 10 hours a week to 20 hours a week, depending on how many assignments I had due. And it's a really big change going into a full-time job where it's nine to five every single day, five days a week. Uh, I mean, when you add on maybe half an hour or an hour of commute on top of it, it, it's really not like you just get a day off here and there, every day is just go, go, go. Um, the, se the second point is that it's very different from university in terms of the feedback you get. So at university you submit an assignment and you get back a mark of something out of 100, maybe an A, B, C, whatever, whatever system they have. And it's very immediate and you might even get some words written on it. But going into full-time work, you don't get that feedback in the same way. You might have an appraisal every three months, six months, 12 months, but it, it's never, this specific thing was good. So it's quite difficult to find what you wanna do you know, it's difficult to figure out what particular things you should be doing to, to be doing a good job. And it comes up as a very um, personal uh, motivation. You need a lot of personal motivation in order to um, not just do the bare minimum. And if you want a good job, you'll need to be able to push yourself and I, I, I suppose not just coast through, you need to be able to bring something to the table. And I, I know I've reversed these around, but the last one I'll touch on is that the work we have is dynamic, especially the consultancy. We um, we have these jobs, they'll come in, they'll, uh, essentially what I'll do is, uh, we'll test an application that might run for two, three, four days, maybe a week or two weeks. And after that I'll have to write a report and then send it on to the client. And so it's not like university because you don't have all these concurrent assignments. Every, not everyone sets all their assignments due on week six and you all have to get them done in that week. Uh, you, in this case, you have your primary work, which is getting a test done, which might be a app, web application or an infrastructure assessment. And then from there, you'll, uh, uh, 
you'll have to write a report and it's all very sequential, but then on top of that there's the regular day-to-day -day stuff, work admin about um, putting in time to leave, putting in um, sick leave, and managing all the other emails that come to you and you don't want to deal with. So again, yeah, there's a lot of difference with the university and, and, and real life and everyone's experience is going to be different, but just be aware that it's not going to be the same. I enjoyed going out every weekend and uh, going hiking and now I am very happy just to stay at home and do nothing. It's great. I suppose there's a few things that um, also didn't happen at university. So number one is the course I was doing, while it was IT related, it was, it was programming and, and, and computer science, I had maybe a week of actual topics that covered cybersecurity. Um, and I think that was a week where we were looking at operating systems and we just looked at plain buffer overflow. And that was really all we did. Um, it, obviously, it's not a, a, t a course designed for cybersecurity. It, it's an introduction course. But um, I, I, I suppose there's a lot of universities starting to offer these um, uh, cybersecurity degrees, and I know Deakin is, is as well. Um, so I, I, I suppose for me, what I had to do is I had to teach myself a lot of this cybersecurity stuff outside in my own time. Uh, the second one is that I suppose the university doesn't have a whole lot of the soft skills, the client relationship that, that someone like me has to deal with every day. Uh, I mean, you have to do time management, that, that, that's part of it. You have to make sure that everything gets in on your dead, deadline. Um, but for example, I was testing a, uh, a new web application this company was putting out, and I was playing around with it, and I'd sent off a couple of messages and put in some funky input. And, um, I was sitting there, and I got a call on my phone from this random number that I haven't seen before. And they, they, they called up and I answered the phone and I asked, who is it? And uh, this is XYZ from this company that I was testing. I was like, this is odd. Why are they calling me? I don't know you. I don't know where they're coming from. And, I, and I, would, I was actually quite surprised because the application I was testing, it wasn't in a production environment. It was in a specific testing development environment. And they told me that they work in the um, customer support team. <laughs> and I had no idea what that was. And I figured out that one of the input fields that I was just putting some stuff into was actually like a feedback form. And even though the company had said that this was a development environment, it was actually going to the, the employees that were sitting there answering legitimate customer uh, inquiries. And so the, the, the things that the university doesn't teach you is how do you deal with these situations? How do you make sure that um, these, uh, how, how can you handle these situations when you're under pressure? And really there's really no training, you just have to uh, figure it out as you go. That, that's one of my bigger tips is figure it out as you go. And I've also mentioned that the things that I haven't learned at the university are what jobs are available. Uh, I, I suppose, I don't know what it's like at Deakin, but at Melbourne University, there wasn't a whole lot about very jobs are very theoretical, and I, whether that's good or bad, I'm not going to comment, but uh, we never had any industry-based learning. We never had any... Um, even for my course, which was a programming course, there was very little um, information about what jobs you would go into. I mean, if you searched around, you'd be able to find it at university, but that would be the same as if you were just searching around and wanted to find it on the internet anyway. So I, I raise these points as, th as things that you don't learn um, because they're things that you'll need to know at some point. And in order to do so, you'll need to actually get out there and do some research for yourself. Finally, I've got a few points that, um, as I said, I, I came into a role and I sort of just fell into it. I had a, someone ask me and I said, yes, that sounds awesome. I've, I, I really enjoy that kind of work. Um, so what actually helped me get this job? And so number one is definitely that I have a personal interest in doing it. There's a lot of, I, I mean, I don't know, um, I don't have any statistics on it, but I can imagine people around here have seen others that are in courses that they just don't know what they're doing. They're just in a course because they want to be in a course. Um, especially at uni, it can be a bit like that. 
and everyone that's trying to figure out the way, I, I, as I said, I didn't know what I was doing, and I was, I suppose, happy and very lucky to, to find something that I really enjoy. So you need that personal interest, and what that means is you're not going to university to just have someone teach you the topic. You want to actually go and research things in your own time. You want to play CTF. You want to play hack, you do challenges on Hack the Box. You want to get involved and actually talk with other people. And the reason I make that, I say that, is that university, if it was just to teach you uh, the relevant attacks at the time, so I mean, say a printf string um, attack, rarely seen anymore, but would have been huge about 10 years ago. Uh, if, if a university was to teach that 10 years ago, it would be very irrelevant knowledge now. And what a university should be teaching, and I'm not sure how it goes here, and I don't know what it's at Swinburne or Monash, but what what people need to get out of the, out of a course is actually the ability to research new topics. So every day I show up on a job and I don't exactly know the technology I'm using. It might be this new uh, technology stack for a web application that I've never used, and I have to be like, hmm, I can apply this knowledge I've learned in the past, and uh, put that into a new situation, and on the other side, I can take uh, some research, take that in, and bring it to this new technology and actually do a good job. The second thing is that I've got, and it's definitely like the first one, is I've got a little home lab at home. It's a little rack. It's got um, a couple of switches. It's got a, some routers, and I, it's really good to actually get an understanding of how networking works. When you're working with computers, everything is very much going to be about networking and OSI. Um, stack, and there's going to be, a, that, that's one side, the other side's really going to be about application security or secure coding kind of side of things. Um, so obviously networks underpin everything in the internet, and that's what we focus a lot of our time on, uh, network-based attacks, as that would, is what most people attacking a company would be doing. So having experience with that for your home lab, which might just be, um, say, a a little Raspberry Pi that you've got a little Docker on and you're spinning up all these different services and playing around with things. You really need to be playing around with things in your own time to, uh, to get a, a feeling for it. Um, and one final thing that actually helped me was I started a blog. It's not up at the moment because I kind of deleted it, but I started a blog that was about some of the research that I was doing at the time and it was on a, um, a modem that I was sent from an ISP. And I, I got it and I looked at it and over the how many years, it, uh, web interfaces on uh, in these embedded devices, they've just gotten more and more restrictive. And I, I think I wanted to do something like change the DNS server, something simple that would have been straightforward, but I couldn't do. So instead of just going and buying a different computer or a different router or a, actually setting up a different uh, DHCP server, I just stuck with this one and I spent maybe five or six weeks on and off actually getting a shell on it, which was fun. And I wrote about that on the blog. And what that does is say if you're going to a job, it makes it very easy for you to be able to actually show uh, an employer or an, or an interviewer what interests you and what you do in your spare time. Because if you just come in and say something, uh, it's very difficult to get across. If you write in a blog post, it, you have to think about it, and it actually comes out very clear. Um, I think that's all I have, but if there's any questions, please let me know. Yes. Um, it's a very theoretical course, I'll say that. Um, and what I enjoyed about Melbourne was that, I, as I said, I went in thinking about doing civil engineering. And obviously that's not what I came out doing. And it was very flexible, it allowed me to change my, um, my uh, classes around. But in terms of the cyber, in terms of the, um, the computer, computer science course, um, I don't have anything to base it on. It, it, it's, it's very theoretical. Um, yeah, if there's, yeah? Lucas? <laughs> Lucas is my boss, by the way. <laughs> yeah. uh, that was a good question. For anyone that didn't hear, uh, Lucas asked, if I, would do it, if I was to do it all over again, would I go down the same path and do cybersecurity? Um, good question. I don't know particular, you know, it's a hypothetical, but I really enjoy, I, I'd say I really enjoy my job and I would be very happy to go down the same path, whether it's through the same pathway of Having a friend who knows a friend who does this it might not be the same, but if I end up in the same role, I'd be very happy. Yes? Absolutely. 
Um, I, I make a joke about university in that it's uh, the time where no one actually expects you to do anything because you just get three years. And I found it really true that I could just go and in my spare time do all these other things that really interested me and then university was just on this spare time to fill in as a bit of an excuse. And that worked really well for me. So um, it was even before university that I was um, playing with programming at high school, I had a bit of a programming club and was writing PHP and C and that kind of stuff back then. So it's always been an interest. It's not something that I picked up from going to university. Yeah? Say again, sorry? Uh, so the question is, what do I have in my home lab? Um, I've got a photo on my phone. Unfortunately, I don't think I can get it on the screen too easily. Um, essentially, it is a, um, from the top down, it's like I've got a patch panel that goes to all my ports in each room in the house. That goes into um, a switch, which has essentially just a single uh, box, a, a single virtualization box on top of an ESXi server. And so on that, I've got a bunch of different networks. So I play with VLANing in uh, my home network so that I'm on uh, my private privileged network where I can access everything, and then everyone else in my house gets the normal internet access, and then guests get restricted internet access, so that kind of fun stuff. Um, I've also got a bunch of Cisco switches, Cisco routers, Juniper switches, Juniper routers. They barely get powered on, but they're nice just to have sitting there and play with if I'm bored. Aaron? Are you suggesting that I would try and manipulate network traffic so that I get priority? <laughs> Potentially, but no, no. I, I, well, I would, I would argue that it wouldn't even be four people. We're on like twelve down, one up in NBN plan. So, yeah, it would take one person on, on Netflix to kill it. So, it's not not, not much of an issue there. All right. Well, thanks all for listening. And well, no. yeah, thank you. <laughs>
so when I said that, you know, it's been you know, a very long time for me being in an industry, it's always been an absolute passion of mine to play around with computers, pull things apart, put them back together, see if they work again. Uh, you know, so growing up, we we had you know CDs, like little remember those things? I'm almost showing my age here, but uh, so I had the CD player. I pulled it apart, put it back together, and it didn't work. And that thing was really expensive. I think it's like four hundred dollars or something like that for a little music box. So I was in, in big trouble. But essentially, moving into the professional field, it was very difficult to get a start. And I think, uh, I'll just run a little survey. Who works in IT at the moment? Okay, who's studying cybersecurity or some kind of IT at the moment? All right, so there's probably about two or three people that put up their hand and saying they're currently working in IT. So the rest of them are trying to get into IT, trying to get into information security, or whether it's just you know um, regular old IT. It's really difficult because you're in this catch-22 situation where you need a job to get experience, but then you need experience to get a job, and you go to an interview saying, do you have any experience or no, but you want to give me a chance, and so it makes things very, very difficult. I, I started off when I was quite young, and I used to fix computers, just, you know, my mum's friend or something like that, her computer will break, and I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll fix it up. Um, and I was just doing it for, for free, because I just like computers. But then when I turned 18, I said, oh, you know what, just get me, just give me a bottle of whiskey or something like that and I'll, and I'll fix up your PC. And then it got to this point where I had this massive cabinet just full of alcohol and I'm just like, I, I could not possibly drink all this stuff. So essentially I said, oh, just give me 50 bucks. I'll oh, just give me 50 bucks, you know, cash in hand, cash in hand. Um, and then I sort of created my own little business. I had an ABN and all these other little things and that was really good because I was, I was, at that point I was studying IT I was, had my own little business on the side, and at the same time I was working for my old high school doing sysadmin type stuff, like network, network admin, sysadmin type thing. So tax return time was brilliant, because I could deduct all my stuff for like travel to and from university, so it was really good. So if you do want to get into IT, start up your own little IT company, and don't rule the tax system. But essentially, um, what happened was um, this very, very interesting part there's, there's these little crossroads in your life, right, where you make a decision, and it's like, if there was always a lecture on a Friday morning, we always went out Thursday night, no one ever went to the lecture on earlier on Friday morning, but it just so happened to be I was there that morning, and a person was, came in from like um, some kind of organization where they were placing interns into roles, right, and there were a few companies, there was the Australian Tax Office, ironically, um, there was IBM, there was NAB, and there was a few other companies there as well. And essentially what they were doing was uh, providing internships for, for, for university students. And it was, I think it was about 1,700 people that applied Australia-wide. So this person went around Australia to all universities. It no longer were, it's no longer running, but I'm sure there might be something similar. So essentially, um, I kind of only had uh, two years into my degree, and I got part of this you know, little thing. So had I not been in that um, little meeting or that little lecture that morning, I wouldn't have gotten a job at IBM. So that's where I got my start. So I was a network engineer at IBM, and I was pretty much just uh, maintaining uh, large networks. So with that, because they were paying for my university, this is how much money I got. I think my annual salary at, when I was at IBM was about $25,000 a year. And uh, I was living here which is super expensive to live in Sydney. So it was very interesting times, and basically I was doing that. So that was me nine months of the year. Three months of the year I was studying because they were sponsoring us to go to university, and I paid for our university degree, which was really good. Three months of the year I was here, over summer. And I should have been doing this here, but instead that was me. But anyway, so moving on, eventually I kind of finished up with that whole system and kind of um, I, I got the experience that I needed, right? So that catch twenty two, so that catch twenty two scenario where you need a job to get experience and experience to get a job, I was kind of out of that, you know, infinite loop. So I got the job, which is great. So I had experience. I was working at IBM for a long time, or a couple of years, and well, a long time when I was there, that that age anyway. 
And we had all these labs available where we had like millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of equipment before that were either shipped out to clients or when they were coming back from clients because their lease ran up and I was essentially sitting in a couple of containers on the loading dock. So a really close friend of mine, uh, of mine and I, basically raided these containers legally because we asked and there was just so much kit in there. So there were switches that were literally about as tall as me and these things were, I think they, were, they cost about half a million dollars and there were switches that were about half the size um, for those that know Cisco gear, it was a 6503R, which is pretty old school, you know, um, big switch now. But So we had this room, this lab, probably about, I don't know, about four metres by four metres, and we had three of them spread, spread across the IBM campus in Sydney. And essentially we had, that was our lab, no one else used it, unless there was a massive incident where we had to replicate an issue in order to kind of fix up a client network. But essentially all we had was all this kit, we had so much compute as well. I was in one of the computer labs here earlier and had a lot of those little think centers. So I think we had set essentially a container full of those things as well. So we just virtualized a whole bunch of stuff and just that's what we we're doing. Every single night after 5 p.m. or in a lab, every single weekend or in the lab, just playing, setting stuff up, learning how it works, tearing it down, setting up something else. So that eventually got me a job at NAB, which is really good. So that was my first real, real career where I got back cash kind of thing. So I was contracting, it was brilliant. It was a lot of work, very, very hard work. And also got to move down to Melbourne, which was really nice. So at that point, I was uh, you know moving around a little bit. Started off in the um, security operations team where we were kind of maintaining all their networks and working with internal stakeholders to make sure that projects can kind of go ahead. And then I had the opportunity to move internally into the pen testing team or what they call the uh, assurance team. So that was pretty much me at that point had doing all the hacking, right? So I'm like, yeah, cool, that's awesome. So I stayed there for a little bit, got a lot of experience, met a lot of really good people, which I'm still in touch these days, and they've kind of moved off, moved on and up and around the world and whatnot. So I thought I might do the same. So I jumped on a plane and I started working here, living here. And it was really fun. So I kind of still had the balaclava on, so I still like quote unquote hacker, but I was just in a suit because I was a consultant then. And that was really good. And I saw some really cool places. I got to work at a lot of awesome places, you know, all around Europe. So some really, really, really nice places, as you can kind of tell. And then some not so nice places, right? So <laughs> you're like, all right, yeah, slough, there you go. <laughs> so, you know, where do I sign, right? So. That was me, and after that, I kind of I came back to Australia, moved up to Brisbane, stayed stayed there for a little bit, worked for another consultancy at a startup, and then eventually I got the role that I'm in now, and I moved back down to Melbourne, which which is probably the best city in Australia. Alrighty, yeah. So um, I like to kind of change tack a little bit to kind of firstly give you an understanding of where I came from, how I got there, and kind of give you a bit of a picture of what the actual industry looks like. So I'm purely talking from mostly a penetration testing perspective slash security operations or SOC analysts because I've had experience in those types of roles as well. And also um, incident response a little bit and also from, um, you know, not really like vendor land but consultancy internal role. I, I was never really a researcher or really a bug bounty hunter. I don't have enough patience for that. Right, yeah, so internal roles. So the big thing as an internal role, and when I say internal role, you, you're working for like a private company such as NAB, where I was working, or, or IBM. Uh, they have internal roles as well, because it's a massive company. At that, when I was working there, they had 330,000 employees worldwide, so it's a huge, huge company. But they also have like a managed services, so they do a consultancy as well. And then there's the, um, the public sector jobs as well. So for those that were down at B-Sides Canberra, ASD seems to be really heavy on the recruitment path. Um, for those that have an opportunity to work in the government sector, especially for somewhere like ASD, I would, I would jump on it. Um, so yeah, so firstly you have to understand what the business is. So at a bank, the business is not information security. To be honest, they, they probably don't, oh, they, they do care about it, but it's not their primary concern. So they're in the business of money, right? Insurance, 
loans, holding your money, maybe losing money, um, those type of things. Not that old way, that way to lose your money. So what's, what's their business? If you're working for a university, for example, if you're in IT at a university, their business is to educate, right? And, and they have other kind of drives as well around research and whatnot. They're not also not in cyber security. So in order to, for you to actually identify what your purpose is in a, in a job, you have to firstly identify what the, the core of the business is. So if you work at a consultancy, which I'll get to in a sec, we kind of, you know, we'll work, we'll work out their motivations. So a day-to-day -day at an internal role kind of can be a little bit boring sometimes. So there's lots of emails, there's lots of, you know, individual development plans and all these type of things as well. You have to, a lot of meetings and whatnot. But fundamentally what you're doing is um, you're helping projects internally kind of get something done, right? So if you're working at a bank and they're rolling out internet banking, you're, you're enabling the business to roll out internet banking. And you'll put your, you know, your security hat on and say, well, we should do these things because of these risks and because of these reasons. Um, so usually in internal roles, in my experience anyway, things like further education was largely based on uh, your own budget. So although certain kind of organizations, they'll, you, you'll go into them, they'll say, hey, you know, we have all this training budget and all these type, type of things as well. Sometimes it's a little bit, it can get too busy and they say, oh no, sorry, maybe next year. Or you didn't put it on your, uh, your, your development plan for this year, we'll have to do it next year. So we'll kind of do it through the appraisal systems. And essentially what they do is pen testing, SecOps, you know, uh, SOC analysts, and so GRC, so like governance, risk, and compliance, where you're kind of doing compliance -y kind of checkboxy stuff, which, which can be interesting as well. Threat hunting, which seems to be um, in vogue at the moment. Uh, it's Intel, so when I was at NAB, we had a threat Intel functionality internally, so we had people uh, trawling, you know, the dark web sort of thing, looking around on that, seeing if people were talking about defrauding banks or you know, financial institutions. There's things like architects as well, which can be really interesting. And that's one of the areas that I was kind of pushing us, my personal career in until I kind of fell into pen testing. And you got things like security admin, which is what probably one of my first roles at, at the bank where I was just maintaining large, large networks, I think. At that stage, I don't know what they, they have now, but at that stage, I think they had close to a thousand firewalls spread across the country, so there's a lot to maintain, as you can kind of imagine. But there are really good initiatives to work at some of these places. I was looking around. Um, so there's like a cyber degree, which probably some of you are in, or, uh, or might change into, or something like that. And then you, know, you can partner up with Dimension Data, ANZ, NAB, and uh, the Vic government. So it says kind of thing with that byline saying students will get an internship and job placements upon graduation, which is pretty good. So then you kind of um, cancel out that catch-22 about getting experience to get a job and a job to get experience. Consultancy slash vendor land. So you have places like Big Four, so KPMG, Ertz and Young, um, PwC and, and the other one. Um, you got boutiques such as Context, you got other like security consultancy firms. Uh, so there's there's a lot around Melbourne. There's a really good one, uh, Assurance. I know the guy that, that runs it, a um, good friend of mine. There's a few other ones um, dotted around as well. So they're like boutique-y. So by, by boutique, that kind of means that they're, they're small, they're quote unquote agile, and um, they kind of have a very, very niche skill set. So for us, we tend to do a lot of hardware stuff. We tend to do a lot of red teaming tend to do a lot of like SCADA networks and whatnot, and as well as the web apps and whatnot as well we do. So, and then you got the vendor land side of things. So you got Checkpoint, Cisco, Microsoft, Juniper, you know, you, you name the product vendor. What's, what do we got here? We got Dell, probably, NEC. So those are all like, you know, vendors where they sell product to, to their customers and you might get into a role where you support it, you integrate it, you, um, maybe design the networks that are going to kind of fit into and stuff too, which is really, really interesting. So consultancies, their motivation, depending on what they do, so boutiques, for example, their motivation is to sell bleeding edge cybersecurity capability. 
So they do invest in their people. We do quite heavily. We'll do, um, I think, anywhere from oh, 10 to 20 days per year of, of internal training or you know, some kind of training, as well as you know, uh, personal research and stuff like that as well. And that's not just us. That's a lot of the other companies that are around as well. So I'm not just trying to get up here and say, come work for us or anything like that. But that is very, very representative of boutiques. Big Four tend to invest in their people as well. I've never worked for Big Four, but I've, I've only heard about it. Startups, uh, that one's a little bit more difficult because at a startup, and I have worked that one, it's, there's a million one things to do every single day because you don't have a lot of the processes and documentation and all this kind of you know, stuff that you really take for granted uh, once you've been in like a big role and kind of moving to something that's never been done before or, you know, or anything like that. You, there are a lot of things that just they just don't exist, so you have to create them. So a lot of your spare time is creating documentation, creating marketing material, creating all sorts of things because it's a startup, or, or just like banging out on a keyboard doing dev. So, you know, the consultancy slash vendor type stuff, there's a bit of overlap, so if I kind of go back to the uh, previous one, so there's a lot of overlap, but consultancies do things that they can sell as a product. So in the end, as a consultancy, you are, you are a product, and that's, that's just how it is, because they sell your expertise to a client. So that could include like, things like pen testing, you know, SOC analysts, GRC again, uh, things like thread hunting, there are companies that do that as well. Um, they do you know, Intel, they do architecture, and there's probably a few other ones as well. Now moving on to like the research bug bounty kind of area. Me personally, I don't really do bug bounties. I think I have a bug crowd account, which I created way, way back when, but it's probably inactive now. But their motivations, especially from, from an independent research perspective, you, if you're an independent researcher, your motivations are to pay your bills. So you may, or may not sell um, things like zero days or vulnerabilities sort of thing to you know to government agencies or even to the vendors because they might give you a bug bounty which is you know, the whole bug bounty kind of model so their motivation is just to generate revenue so essentially you are your own business and I know a few people around the world that do this kind of work they love it they stay in their pajamas till about two or three in the afternoon and Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but when they do, they're probably up for about two or three days straight because they're, they're on the winner. So their day-to-day -day can vary. You know, uh, I've got a really close friend of mine that tends to travel around the world. I think he's in Thailand at the moment, just chilling out and he's just smashing out some bug bounties. So yeah, so the reality check here is, uh, I'll say this at b so sorry if you heard it already, but uh, we are in a information age. So we're no longer in the industrial revolution or anything like that. So because we're in an information age, you get paid for the information you know, and that's fundamentally it. If you do not know anything, if you don't invest in your own time, don't set up home labs and invest in your own uh, stuff that you know as information, no one's gonna pay you for it. R really, no one's gonna pay you anything. So with that, I'll kind of move on to you know things like mapping out the industry. So that's basically the industry. So now, you know, you're all, uh, students or most of you are students and you want to essentially get a job right so this this one's basically been pilfered from uh, a presentation I did with Ricky Burke at B sides Canberra this year so if you've seen it this would look very familiar but essentially you want to kind of map out what sector you want to get into if you don't know that's absolutely fine play around look around ask um, you know feel free to come up to me and ask questions or anyone else that you know in the industry you know, there's a couple of people in this, in this room that work uh, full time now. So yeah, ask them. Uh, so LinkedIn, have a look around who's, who's doing what, who, you know, if they've got something like blockchain uh, or you know, cryptocurrency evangelist or something like that, they're probably un unemployed, so I'm probably going to ask them. <laughs> um, but do your OSINT. If you are going, actually going for a job, do, you, do your intelligence gathering because what actually happens just say if you applied for a job with me, uh, I got your CV in front of me and I'll, I'll just start Googling you. So if you have a blog, so like Maddie's blog, he doesn't know this, but the Wayback Machine is really good. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would actually look you up. Are you on LinkedIn? Yes or no? Do you have a blog? Do you have a you know, GitHub repo? Those types of things, all prior to your interview. And 
you know, I would expect you to kind of talk about those things. Saying, well, hey, do you have a GitHub copy button? What's it like? What, you, what kind of stuff are you doing? If it's anything like mine, it's pretty non-existent. Um, and just target the role in the companies you want to work for, right? So if you want to work for an internal team, if you want to work for a consultancy, not everyone can work for a consultancy. It's really, really tough work. You have to be super technical. You have to be uh, very client-facing. You know, be able to talk to people and just single them out like I am right now. Um, those types of things, right? Uh, but you can work for an internal team where you, you, you can essentially not really go into the corner and just do your own thing, but you can do other things as well. So once you've had contact, once you've made contact with the person, you know, you, you want to um, show them what, what value you're going to deliver to them. So if it's a bank, say, you know what, I, I did a bit of finance stuff at uni, or I'm actually quite interested in what you're doing in this space. And like, show them that you've done your, your um, research, right? Um, show them that you also have a passion for these things as well. So I'm gonna move away from you, because <laughs> you're squirming. <laughs> Um, right, yeah, so I'm gonna focus on you now. <laughs> so show them that you have a passion. Like, you know what, I really love this stuff. I know about banking, I know about this, I know about that. Uh, you know, when the GFC hit, I, you know, I watched the big short and it was really cool, all those types of things, right? So show them that you understand the industry that they're in and you're passionate about it. And then also, more importantly, that you're passionate about what you do and what you're interested in. And that kind of leads into them thinking that you have the skills and abilities to fulfill the role. I mean. Let's, let's be honest, no one here is going to be jumping up to like a principal security role. You're going to be starting probably, you know, close to the bottom, but, you know, maybe a little bit up, up from the bottom, depending on your experience and stuff too. So no one's expecting you to, you know, oh yeah, I'll just come on board and tomorrow I'll just have some zero day for Microsoft Word sort of thing. It's, it's not going to happen. So be, be realistic with your skills and abilities, but more importantly, show that you have the passion and the fact that you're a team player. So at, at universities, you, you do a lot of team assignments. So things quite commonly that I was always complaining about when I was doing assignments in the team environment, I was like, I'm always doing all the bloody work, right? And it's probably don't, don't tell them that because that might kind of indicate saying, well, he's not really a team player because he's just, he's just, you know, right now he's his mates. Um, and if you want, you can look for a long-term employer to grow with. Um, I did that at NAB. I was with NAB for about three or four years, and that was a really good place to work. So if you do have the opportunity to get a grad role there, jump on it. It's a really, really awesome place. And I stayed there, and I, and I, and I grew with the environment. And unfortunately, I was in a position where I kind of outgrew it, and my feet got itchy, and I wanted to go overseas. Right, yeah, so I would say, so hidden jobs. So this one's basically how you get a job. So. These are actual stats sort of thing that Ricky put together. So 51% of jobs are through a network, which is really interesting. So in this room sort of thing. So you might all grow up together sort of, um, in, a, in, in a university setting and then maybe move into a professional life. Some of you guys might be friends later on. Five years down the track, you might bump into one another, or have a coffee and say, hey, you know what? I got a job, uh, you know, hey, I'm, I'm opening if you're, if you're keen on it. It's this, it's this, it pays this, and actually, you know what? I've been kind of a bit bored recently. I might, I might jump on that. Thanks, man. So those are the types of things I'm talking about, and that's very, very common. So in my professional life, I've only applied for one job, IBM. That's it. Right, there's a lot of text there, so I'll, the slides will be up and whatnot, but you can read through. But, uh, you know, there's a big chunk of the industry that got their job without applying for an online advert. I've, I have applied for a few online jobs that you know didn't really pan out. Meetups and cons such as you know um, these ones sort of thing are really really good. I'll skip past this part to kind of maybe move into a more of a Q and A. You will go through an interview, so I'll, I'll talk you guys through what I look for when I interview candidates. Like as I was saying before, preparation. Do, do your research. If you're, I have actually seen applications that said dear sir, madam, or literally in in blocks that said, dear, insert name here, sort of thing, like it was a, it was just mass emailing out to someone and a whole bunch of emails there. So that one gets binned, binned straight away. Because why, you know, why would I waste my time if you can't be bothered spending 10 seconds to type in my name? And if you have a name like mine, uh, I do look out for this. And not that I'm gonna bin your, your CV, because that would just be me being a jerk, but do you, do you spell my name right? 
right? Those are little, little, little things that kind of um, account to a lot. Because I have a really unique name, and you'd be surprised how often people just, you know, instead of L U K A S said, they'll say L U C A S. So it's like, oh God, that really, really gets me every time. But anyway, so do your research in the company, what they do. If you're applying at a consultancy, then, you know, what, what do they do? Okay, they only do pen testing or they do a lot of GRC or they do a lot of this or they do a lot of that. And first of all, you might actually identify saying, you know what, what they do is not actually what I want to do. It's kind of boring or it's actually not really want to, where I want to take my career. I want to do architecture. So you'll apply at an architect firm, not like building houses, but building networks. Are there any, is there any things like recent news um, for them, right? So me coming here, I Googled Deacon Cyber and that thing came up, I'm like, that's probably a really good thing to put in, right? So that's just basic research. Uh, the interviewers, so quite commonly, uh, while we do this with our, in, with our interviews, we have a, a person that schedules the interviews and that person will reach out to the candidate and saying, hey, your interview is with Matt Dunwoody or your interview is with Lucas. So Google them, you know, you'll see, like with Matt, you'll see he's presented at B-Sides Melbourne and you could go into him saying, hey Matt, I'm really sorry I missed your presentation at B-Sides Melbourne. Uh, I, I asked around and it was really good, so I heard really some awesome feedback. Um, so yeah, thanks. And that kind of shows them that you've done a, a little bit of your own research as well. Dress code, not every place is a suit. So if you're working at a bank, probably would go in a suit if you're w going into an interview. If it's a startup or if it's you know that kind of thing, might be a little bit more relaxed. But essentially, just you know trousers and and a shirt is is always fine. Um, or for the ladies, you know, something something nice as well, like like businessy attire. You don't have to go in a cocktail dress or anything like that. So, um, and the type of interview, identify what the type of interview is. If you don't know what the type of interview interview is, ask, because we've had people come in saying, and we'll go through a technical interview. So the stages we go through, it's usually a phone screen. I'll give the person a phone call and saying, hey, tell me about yourself. Blah 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 blah. You know, what do you do? Saying, oh, you know, I'm in a Deacon Cybersecurity Club and I do this, I saw your presentation, I thought I'll apply or, or whatever. Um, so, oh, cool. And then we kind of go into a face-to-face. -face, like, who are you? You know, those types of things. And then um, we, we kind of mold the face-to-face -face along with the technical interview as well. So sometimes you just go straight into the tech if the, the phone interview is really good and you kind of uh, had some really good skills there. So the technical interview essentially run people through, you know, a few pen tests. So here's a web app, here's some stuff, here's a, some other stuff. Hack it and go for it, and show your your research and your abilities while you're going through it as well. So ask what type of interview it's going to be. Right, yeah. So don't get there too early, please. Don't get there too early. I've had interviews that um, have been at quite early because a person is currently employed and they don't want to you know, take a half day off or something like that, just a little interview, or don't want to take the full day off. So they'll say, hey, can we do it after hours? Or, hey, do you mind if I come in early, like maybe 8 a.m. before I start work? They usually take about an hour. And, and, that, and that's usually fine, depending on the person you, you're talking to. But this person was there like 20 minutes early, and I wasn't even around. So so there, there I was, I came in, I'm like, oh, crap, I'm so sorry. How long were you waiting for? Uh, and, oh, it's fine, it was only 10 minutes. Then I feel really, really bad, and it's like I'm hurrying everything along. And that potentially, um, you know, has a detrimental effect on the actual interview process as well. Because I'm, I'm hurried into, you know, performing a tech interview, for example. So ask questions. I mean, I'll skip past the points, but the most important one is ask questions. So the questions you can ask during an interview, they will show that you've done your research, for example. So, I don't know if you guys can read that, it's a bit small, but um, so some of the experience where interviewers have failed or they weren't, you know, they didn't make the cut, and depending on the company, uh, certain companies set the bar really high and with who they intake and others, you know, the bar's not as high because they don't, ha they don't perform a certain type of work. But I'll let you guys read through some of those. But um, one of the most common ones is, especially during a tech interview, is um, the focus on tools and automation. So we've had certain tech in, in interview or certain interviewees come through and they'll say, oh, can I use Burp Scanner or can I use 
SQL map, can I use all these tools? And it's like, well, yeah, you can, but I really want you to show me what you actually understand about these tools. Like anyone, everyone runs tools. You know, professional pen testers, we run tools a lot because they, they speed everything up. But when the tools fail, and they very, very often do, you have to fall back into like a manual position where you're, you're actively trying to probe something. And there's some other ones there as well. So the lack of understanding of fundamentals is, uh, is a big one for me. So if you're a pen tester, if you want to get into the pen testing role, if you want to become a stock analyst as well, you have to understand how things work. Matty touched on that in his presentation before about doing lab stuff, doing all sorts of things like that as well. And I'll get into a little bit of it in, in a sec, but you have to understand how things work. So a type of question I might ask is, explain to me how the internet works. And you're like, oh, there's a bunch of web apps. It's like, okay, cool. <laughs> so these are the generally the types of things. Uh, home lab, I cannot stress this enough. Right? I still have my own home lab that I'm playing around with constantly and bat bashing my head against the wall with sometimes. And like, you know, Matty alluded to before with his home lab, it's got multiple zones and all these types of things. My one does as well. So I've got like my personal area and I've got like management zone and then I've got um, my wife, she's in a rental zone <laughs> with her malware infested devices potentially. Um, and then there's like the guest VLAN and there's all the other bits and pieces as well. And I've got like a CCTV network and all these kind of weird and wonderful thing. And these things, I, I was running Microtech for a long time. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. I kind of got my head around it, how it worked. It frustrated the hell out of me. And I know Cisco, so I went, I bought some Cisco switches and I just implemented those at home. Do, do participate in bug bounties and stuff, but don't, honestly don't expect to make a living out of it. Unless there's only, I think it's like 0.1% of people in the world actually make a, a, a living out of bug bounty programs. A lot of the others are, it's really good to kind of like, you know, for beer money and stuff. But um, yeah, don't, don't hang your hat on it. If you have any CVEs or you are doing some research as part of your bug bounties, make sure you publish that. Ha have a blog post. I've got about 10 blog posts, all with hello world. So uh, I don't really do blog posts. But participate in CTFs, like the Cypher stuff is really cool. B-Sides, um, Canberra does a lot of CTF stuff as well. So do participate in those. And if you place, make sure you, you, you mention it, saying, oh, hey, we came third or we came fifth or whatever. It's actually a really good thing. Um, and have certifications, which I'll get to in a sec. Like, oh, SCP is actually a pretty decent one, decent one. It's quite expensive, though. So I know when I was a uni student, uh, and even when I was working at IBM for 25 grand a year, I couldn't afford, I, I could never afford something like OSCP, which costs, I think it's over $1,000. 1600 there you go. That's a lot of money to spend. Um, and yeah, like helping out friends and family out with security to gain practical experience. So I helped out my family and friends with IT stuff, and I was fixing computers, and that's how I learned about computers. So there's, only one certification up there for a reason. Uh, I would say CCNA is probably one of the most um, recommended certifications I would get. Not to kind of say that the rest of them are not good or, or anything like that, but if you get something like CCNA or something equivalent that shows you how networks work, shows you how the OSI model works, um, you can quite easily understand how the internet works. It goes through things like DNS, it goes through things like routing protocols, it goes through things like MPLS networks and carrier grade networks and how those things work and even going back to Token Ring, which was around a little while ago. So yeah, so certifications. If you can, CCNA, it's pretty cheap. It's very, very cheap. The actual exam itself is like a couple hundred bucks and the books are, are pretty cheap as well. So, the next bit of this one, so Ricky Burke did like a little survey around like SISOs and stuff. And so he sent out a survey, I think it was like 27 people or 27 participants, there's a, there's a number later on. And he said, you know, um, he asked him a bunch of questions around things like, what was your challenge in breaking into the industry? So the slides will be up and you can, I would recommend reading some of these things because SISOs are pretty much running organizations, cybersecurity kind of models. 
Uh, so things like, you know, like they got it in because they're a junior entry level position available. So one of the guys I used to work with at uh, IBM, he was one of the like execs, and he started off in the mail room. He was a mail boy way back when that was a thing. Um, and, or some people were like myself, just kind of fell into it. You know, I never really wanted to get into cybersecurity, but I always had a passion for IT. But I'll let you go through those other ones later on. So this one, so yeah, 27 people were surveyed for this one around uh, is there a cyber security skills shortage? I was the one that one of the, one of the people that answered no. So my own personal opinion, not that of my employer. I don't think there's a skills shortage. I think there's um, a specific talent shortage. So especially in my role, sorry? Well, so in my role as pen testing, I don't think there's a, a shortage of pen testing skills, but there's a shortage of really good talent. Does that make sense? So one of the other ones, I'll skip past this one because you probably won't be able to read it at the back. This one's probably, can you read that at the back there? Yeah, okay. So the sizes that we in, um, interviewed were asked a series of questions and say, hey, rate um, the type of roles that you're after in your organization right now. This is, I think it was this year. It was just, just before B-Sides Canberra, so yeah, it was this year. So threat hunting is pretty much the number one skill set that sizes are looking for. I had lunch with, I was in Sydney uh, yesterday and I had lunch with one of the sizes. I don't think he responded to this survey but one of our clients, uh, and I mentioned this, this graph to him, and he said, yeah, threat hunting is definitely something we're looking for. I can't find anyone. There's no one that has those specific skill sets that can kind of help us and identify uh, threats on our network. Security architecture is still a massive thing. A lot of the banks, they have dozens of architects on their books, constantly uh, maintaining pipelines of projects coming through. So think about it, if you're something like Facebook, the first time Facebook said, we know what, we want to integrate, we've bought this product and we're going to start putting videos in our timelines, right? There was an architect that needed to architect the entire thing from start to finish uh, of how that's going to integrate and how that's going to segregate, you know, different portions like two different companies and securely. So incident response is a massive one, so things like SOC type stuff, application security. But if you read it and you go all the way down, the fourth from the bottom is penetration testing. And that's 18 and a half percent of size that said they need pen testers. They probably don't need a lot of pen testers in organizations as such because they, they can reach out through places like you know context information security or assurance or there's other companies as well that are around that offer the, the professional services. But they're not specifically looking for pen testing internally. So the final point I kind of leave you guys on is the biggest thing that we need in our industry is diversity. And that's not just male, female, that's age, that's background, that's experience. So one of the best people, one of the best pensioners I've, I've ever known uh, is working, working for Context out of our London office and he used to be a biology teacher, right? Because he had a unique mindset and he was kind of going down a certain path and he said, I like the cyber security stuff and he got into it and he's one of the best guys I know. And there's PhDs in mathematics, there's you know all sorts of weird and wonderful kind of backgrounds that help people get in. There's students that didn't really study specifically around cyber security or anything like that and they come in and they're absolutely, absolutely brilliant. So I'll kind of leave it on that. Um, hopefully there's some questions. I kind of threw in a little career thing there. So, um, what I would encourage people to do though is work overseas if you can. I, one of the best moves I made in my career was living and working in London. I learnt a lot. Thankfully I was working for a good company but there are others over there as well. So there are other consultancies that operate in the UK which have some really, really gifted individuals working for them. So reach out to there, to those guys if you're, if you're over there. And I don't know what the deal with Brexit is at the moment but <laughs> See how that one goes. But yeah, so, and just get lots of experience. Any questions? All right. So the question was, how do you know whether you're working in a good company or whether you're stuck in there? So 
there's a website called Glassdoor. So it's, uh, I think it's UK based and you can do a bit of research. So it's totally anonymous, but what you can do is actually go online and review the company you work for or the company you worked for. And you'll see a lot of feedback on that. And some of them might say, oh yeah, the guy that, the guy that runs it is a complete tool. You know, he doesn't know what he's doing. Or they might say, you know what, this is a really, really good company to work for. Glass door, I think it's called. Yeah. Sorry? Glass door, yeah. Uh, there's that. But also, it should kind of, I know you guys are probably in a situation where you're really eager to get into the industry and you'll just take anything that kind of comes along. But take note of the interview process, right? So if, if the person interviewing you is full scatterbrain, they're not ready, uh, they're not asking you the appropriate questions. If you feel it's like, well, there's something off here, there probably is something off, right? They're probably not a good manager or leader. So that might be a good indicator. Uh, have a look at how many people have left the organization as well. So retention rate is a massive metric for a lot of companies. So, you know, how, how long do people stay? And also a really good, really good metric would be if people come back. So like, I, I came back because I left Context and I came back because I actually, I, I really do enjoy it. We've had someone recently rejoin after being away for two weeks. So, and then, but there are, are, are other companies as well that people go back to. So I'm not just saying Context is the best one, but there are other ones as well. Right, so just look at that. LinkedIn, you can actually look at that as well. So if you see other people that work there, you can do your research around, around their team and say, oh, this person, you know, worked at NCC Group, and they went off, they did something else, they went blah, and then they, oh, they're back there, or they worked at NAB, they went off for a little bit, and then they're back at NAB. Any other questions? Cool. Now, what's your opinion with people who apply and then don't turn up for social media posts that they're interested in, or like, say, like, Jordan Paul posts that they don't want to be in the company for a certain amount of time, or whatever? Yeah, so the question was around, um, you know, what, what, what do I do or, or what, what generally gets done? Like if, if, if I'm interviewing you and you don't have any social media presence or any LinkedIn or anything like that, um, to be honest, like if I research you and I can't find anything, I'm like, okay, cool, I can't find anything. Uh, but if, if you're, it's obviously you mentioned it, so you might be particularly worried about it or it might be in the forefront of your mind, just, just go into the interview and saying, hey, I don't know if you did research on me, I'm not. I'm. I'm. A bit, I'm a bit privacy focused, so I don't really have a social media presence. Oh. Uh, but on that as well, on that research, I do look at things like Twitter posts and whatnot. So if you're just like spewing out absolute hate, then it's <laughs> yeah. like it's not going to happen, right? Yeah, yeah. And that, a lot of companies will be in that same boat because when you're working for a company, you are representing them yeah, in some way, some way or fashion. I mean, the slides are not branded. I mean, there's a context thing there, but just, there you go. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the slides aren't really branded. Um, this is me. Uh, I'm just saying this is my background. Uh, but at the same time, I am representing context right now, right? So you always are. Any other questions? Well, um, you mentioned textual quite a bit. Yeah. So, so I can, I'm happy to step you guys through not really a step-by-step -step of how we do it, because it's kind of it's like cheating on the exam. <laughs> but uh, what a very likely type of interview, interview might entail. So you'll typically be sat down. If you bring your own laptop, that's, that's probably a good sign as well, saying, you know, I'm comfortable with my own tools and know how to use my own stuff. So um, that's cool, but if not, usually they'll provide you with an environment or something like that. So what we have, we, we have our own We've got a massive environment which we've been contributing to for uh, probably a decade now, or over a decade. And every now and then there's a new virtual machine with like a new hacking challenge kind of uploaded to that environment. And I think we're up to like 110 or something like that, which is ridiculous, right? So it's picture hack in the box. Like we had hack in the box before it was cool kind of thing. So with that, so um, we'll sit you down. We'll go through some stuff like tell me, Tell me, you know, about a time where you've had to, you know, overcome a technical challenge, for example. And you might be like, oh, you know, 
like for me personally, the most recent one was implementing Elk. Like, it, like there's a um, the log stash sort of thing and Elasticsearch and Kibana and all that crap. So was, that was an absolute pain. That took me an entire weekend. So I might talk about something like that and how I got past it. And it's just like, well, I read a lot and I was on Stack Overflow a lot. I'm on a lot of forum posts where everyone just says, yeah, I have the same problem. I have the same problem. Yeah, me too. So yeah, those types of things, right? So talk about that. And then that might kind of uh, answer that question, but then we'll probably move on to putting you in front of a computer, putting you into one of these environments like Hack the Box or like Pentester Lab, and we'll just say, okay, so there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability on this page, find it and exploit it. Or there's SQL injection on this page, find it and exploit it. Or this web server is misconfigured, this infrastructure is misconfigured, uh, or this box here with this IP address, you can get a shell on that, go. Those types of things. So things that you would do in a CTF anyway. Right? So those things should be almost second nature. And what, what I'm looking for and what potentially people in my position are looking for is how you go about it. Do you, like, what's your, what's your internal methodology, right? Because as consultancies, we have our methodologies. We have a standard type of assessment that we kind of do. We have a standard approach to those assessments as well. Just want to know yours as well. Because uh, that might be something that we don't do. And they'll be, actually, you know what? That's really interesting. I've never really thought of that. Tell me more about that tool that you're using. Or tell me more about that technique. And then that might spark, you know, the passion side of things. Of like, oh, yeah, I found this tool like two years ago. I've, up I've updated it. And there's a pull request, but the guy just doesn't, you know. You know, so those types of things. And that's what we're looking for. So it is a technical interview. Like, do you know the basics? Or if you're, if you're applying for a, a junior position, do you know the basics? If you're applying for a senior or principal position, you should, we should definitely know the basics at least, but you should be going above and beyond for those things. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? I think that's it. If you do have any questions, you just don't want to yell them out, just, just come grab me and we can talk. Thanks.